Okay, thank you, I, and uh, good afternoon. So the morning session, I, I took a peek at the time, is, is now extending into the afternoon. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to uh, have a chance to present to you um, a sampling of computer simulation uh, activity that we're engaged in at Northern Kentucky University. Computer simulations that are, are sponsored um, financially by the National Science Foundation. And I, I'm sensitive to the fact that there's really only a very tenuous connection between the work I'm going to describe to you today and hyperfine interactions. And so I'd like to try to compensate, possibly overcompensate, by showing you PAC spectra on the first slide. And um, now this is somewhat dated uh, data. And, um, but well, what it shows, uh, this is uh, 111 indium PAC in palladium-3, gallium-7, and it shows probes are distributed on two different gallium sites. Um, there's a high-frequency signal and a low-frequency signal. And as we go up in temperature, uh, we see nuclear relaxation. And this uh, relaxation is caused by cadmium probes jumping among gallium sites. And uh, what's interesting, uh, to us anyway, is the fact that there seems to be a, diff a factor four difference in the jump rates on the two gallium sites. And that's something uh, that's not so easy to explain, something that we think is worth uh, exploring more. Uh, but this is just, I, I give this to you as an example of that there's interesting effects to be uh, measured, discovered, examined using PAC in intermetallic compounds. Uh, there's many other examples involves, involving psychoc site occupation, that is where the PAC probe goes in the compound. Uh, you can study defect processes, defect association, and one of the things I'm most interested in studying is uh, diffusion processes. And um, there's just a vast number of intermetallic compounds that one could think about studying. There are over 600 compounds that form in, this, in these three structures alone. Um, but at the same time, you have to match the PAC probe with the compound. And even then, many of the compounds may not give particularly interesting results. And so what we'd like to do is try to kind of eliminate certain systems that aren't worth considering to try and save money, save time, um, so experiments that aren't worth bothering with, and maybe even predict experiments that we expect to give interesting results. And so um, we'd like to do computer simulations to, to, to do these searches. And so we have a couple choices. We can think about uh, ab initio density functional theory type methods. We can think about uh, methods based on empirical potentials. And so as we think about that, there's kind of a spectrum of accuracy and speed. And so we think about density functional theory uh, being more accurate and the empirical potentials have the advantage of the greater speed. And so thinking in terms of a goal here isn't necessarily to be accurate. Um, we want to do experiments to find out what the actual answer is. Um, then maybe we can sacrifice a bit of accuracy and um, go for some speed in order to explore uh, a wider range of compounds faster. So that's the approach we're using, using empirical methods. And in particular, we're using a, a variety called the modified embedded atom method, MEME. And uh, the reason for that is that there's a variation called the second nearest neighbor <coughs> MEME, um, for which uh, we have potential parameters for 39 elements. And so when we're wanting to kind of create a lot of different uh, compounds from the periodic table, we have a, a decent number to choose from. Um, but for anyone who does PAC in this room, you'll notice that there's uh, uh, an atom missing, right? And that's the cadmium. And so uh, it'd be nice to, uh, to have a potential for that. And the purpose of this work is to develop a potential parameter set that we can use for cadmium. Um, so the essence of an empirical simulation is to calculate the total energy of the crystal in, the, in, the, in meme. Uh, it consists of two terms, the uh, embedding uh, parameter, which depends on the background electron density, and then there's also a, a short range pair potential. Um, I, the, the functional forms of these are pretty complicated. I don't think there's a lot of point in going over those, 
but what's relevant is that there are 15 empirical parameters we have to determine uh, in order that to use this to model our system. And so just kind of to give an idea of how, how this process works, if we think about cadmium metal, um, it's been measured using a lot of different methods. Many of the properties are well known. Uh, it's cohesive energy, structural properties, elastic properties, and so forth. Of course, what we'd like to know is more about its behavior in compounds, and we'd like to predict that behavior in advance so we know which ones are worth studying. And so the strategy here is to develop a model that describes the cadmium that we can examine in the computer. The computer can calculate the properties. What we uh, need to do then is check to make sure that the model is describing the properties uh, well enough. And um, when we develop a potential model, what we do is we just essentially guess the starting parameters. We can make decent initial guesses, but it's essential to guess. And then um, we look to see where they don't agree well with the properties. We refine the potential parameters, recalculate the properties, and we go through this cyc cyclical process until we're satisfied with the potential model. Right? And so then once we're satisfied, then we can think about going ahead and calculating some of this behavior, predicting these unknowns. Right? So the work I'm describing to you today is really just this first step, and I'll, I'll mention briefly uh, what we have in store for the future. Um, so following this cyclical process of refining potential parameters, uh, these are the numbers we get. I don't think these numbers have a lot of meaning in this context, so I won't dwell on them. And we want to think about some of the results that this produces. All right, so uh, it, uh, the parameters uh, reproduce the cohesive energy well. Uh, that's not a surprise. That's kind of an input parameter. As far as the uh, structural parameters, it's, it's best to look at the uh, atomic volume. We get good agreement there. The C over A ratio, I, I guess I should have mentioned, cadmium is HCP structure. So this is for the hexagonal close pack structure. Uh, C over A ratio is over, overestimated. Um, I'm satisfied with that. There's a long story about that ratio and why that might be acceptable that uh, I think is, is probably more is of technical interest, uh, maybe not of so much interest to this room. So unless somebody asks about it uh, later, I'll, I'll just plow ahead here. So I'd say that these are satisfactory. Um, can also calculate the elastic constants, look at the elastic properties. And again, these are very satisfactory when comparing uh, to other studies. If I leave this up here long enough and you start calculating those percent differences in your head, you, you, you might call that into question, but nevertheless, I claim that those are satisfactory. Um, and again, there's a story there in case we need more details later. Uh, I'm mainly interested in defect properties, uh, and so uh, we can use these simulations to calculate the uh, uh, vacancy formation enthalpy, vacancy formation uh, entropy, and do this as a function of different supercell size indicated here by uh, a plot versus 100 divided by the number of atoms in the supercell. And so then we can extrapolate back to infinite supercell that corresponds to zero in the graph. And uh, I should mention that these calculations are done at constant volume. And so then these gives us the formation enthalpy and entropy at constant volume, uh, which is nice, except that experiments are done at constant pressure thermodynamically. Um, now, in this limit, the constant volume and constant pressure values for formation enthalpy are the same, so that's not a problem. But for entropy, we need to make a correction. There's a lot here, but basically, the correction we need is known. Um, the formula is, is rel relatively simple. We just need to get at these other parameters, uh, including a parameter of interest is the uh, vacancy formation volume, relaxation volume, and we can calculate those and apply the correction. So then we get these final values for our simulation and experiment, see good agreement in the enthalpy. The entropy, I would have liked to have been closer, but um, I, think, I think that's perfectly adequate. It's, it's hard to know for sure because this is not a value that's reported in the literature commonly, so it's, it's just simply difficult to assess. Um, so we can do, so th those calculations were all 
well, not all, but okay, so I'm doing a mix of total energy calculations uh, that are uh, enthalpy, cal enthalpy minimization calculations. We can also do Gibbs free energy calculations, get things like specific heat, it's a good agreement there, and uh, can look at uh, lattice parameter expansion, um, get good agreement in the A parameter. The C parameter doesn't look so nice. Um, again, this is part of the story with the C over A ratio that um, this is kind of a um, but I think that's going to be satisfactory for um, looking at defect properties. Um, another thing that's been uh, considered, another property that's considered more by p uh, in recent derivations of uh, mean potentials is the properties of, oops, too many buttons, is the properties of uh, these elements at their melting temperature. And so now we can switch to doing molecular dynamics simulations. Um, and uh, this uh, animation is showing um, calculations doing a direct heating where we're keeping this cell at constant pressure, constant, um, constant pressure, increasing the temperature at one Kelvin per picosecond, um, somewhat rapid. And you can see that as it increases in temperature, the, we're getting more and more vibration in the atoms. Uh, we've gone past the experimental melting temperature of cadmium, and we, when we get to about 740 Kelvin, uh, we'll see the, the simulation uh, turn to a liquid. Okay, and so this simulation then predicts, you know, overestimates the melting temperature of cadmium. Uh, this is simply a shortcoming in the direct heating uh, method. It's known to overestimate melting temperatures because of superheating. So a better approach is to do molecular dynamic simulations at constant volume, constant energy, and um, where we put together a slab of liquid and solid. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a long simulation time. The loop doesn't do it justice, but uh, we put a liquid and solid together, um, and we let it equilibrate, uh, constant volume, constant energy. And what since this is a coexistence of two phases, the temperature that comes out and the simulation should be the melting temperature. And uh, I've only run very, very small simulations um, as far as numbers of atoms are concerned. And so we get a lot of scatter here. And, um, and But I think that this, this is sufficient to, to indicate you know, very roughly that the simulation is, is predicting uh, a melting temperature slightly b below 500 uh, Kelvin, which is almost 100 degrees Kelvin below the experimental point. So in fact, the model is underestimating the melting temperature. And uh, we can also use this uh, to calculate some other properties at the melt. We can look at the change in enthalpy between uh, the solid and the uh, liquid. And we can look at the change in volume at the melting temperature, like so. And, um, and so these are then the, the simulation values and you can see when you compare those to experiment, I would say they agree rather poorly. Okay, and so um, just to kind of get to the points here, well, I think the uh, this potential set is going to be adequate for looking at defect properties, and we can go ahead and and, and use that for the intended purpose. Um, I think they may not be up to the task of doing thermodynamic calculations and doing uh, exploring phase diagrams and phase equilibria probably need to do a little bit of extra tweaking of those parameters to get those in line but with the expectation that it's going to be adequate for these atomic processes in solids the next step here is to um, do some simulations in um, some systems that we'd have some experimental results and this brings me back to the palladium-3, gallium-7, right? This is a very attractive next step because if, um, the, we have potentials for palladium and for gallium, okay? And there's also a lot of experimental data in these rare earth compounds. Um, and so that's something that's also very attractive to do, but there's a notable absence of potential parameters for those rare earths. So we need to develop some potential models for those before going on to this. So just to, to summarize, this is really just a recap of, of what I've done already, but perhaps, or what I've said already, but maybe I'd like to highlight this, this first step, kind of the idea 
that I'd like um, people here to do, especially those people using hyperfine methods uh, that involve tracers um, uh, in, um, in solid systems, is to consider perhaps you can use some simulations, um, possibly rougher, more empirical simulations, uh, as, a, a, as a means of selecting experiments to do uh, in addition to um, using computer simulations only to help uh, interpret the experimental results. So I think there's, there's uh, more than one way that we can employ computer simulations in our line of work. And so thank you very much. <laughs>